you would this morning, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Our reading this morning will begin with verse 7. I'm going to read down through verse 16. That's really the context of uh, all of this uh, this morning, so we're going to read that. But if you would please stand in honor of God's Word. But each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, so that we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the properly measured working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. So we come this morning, as we have said before, to the, what we consider the practical portion of the book of Ephesians. We've talked about that, the first three chapters being the foundational doctrinal uh, aspect of the church, the promises to God's people, uh, spoke much of God's grace, salvation by grace, and also uh, the fact that there is no longer two bodies, but there is one body, Jew and Gentile, both being joined together. And so we worked our way all through that, and so we've begun to talk here about this unity in the body in the first six verses really here of uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians and what that looks like. And so we've reached the portion now, really beginning with verse 7, that talks about the different gifts to the church. And that's really what the focus is going to be on today. Now, there may be some that are going to be disappointed. I'm not going to get into the thing in verse 8 where he ascended and descended and uh, carried captivity captive and all of that. That's a very, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but very in-depth study. And so I want to give ample time to all of that, but I do think it is important for us to understand about spiritual gifts, because that's really what we're going to talk about today. When he says here in verse 7, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, we understand that grace was given to us in salvation, for by grace are you saved through faith. But there's also gifting of the grace of God in other realms. We understand that before. I preached a series, it's been many years ago, probably none of you would remember it here, about all the different kinds of God's grace there are in the Word of God. There's saving grace, there's sustaining grace, there is giving grace, there's suffering grace, there is uh, all of these different kind of graces and the sufficient grace that, that like Paul received in 2 Corinthians 12. But in this particular, what we're looking at here is the grace that is given to the church for ministry. Now, when we talk about ministry so often in the church, many people say, oh, yeah, you're, you're, the, you're the minister of the church. You're the only one here to do ministry. Wrong. <laughs> That's not true. There is a way in which all of us as children of God are to minister within the church. This is what we're to do. And so Paul is entering into this, and he talks about it, each one of us, grace given according to the measure of God's gift. Now, he's talking about these gifts of grace. I think they are the gifts of Christ given to the church through the Holy Spirit, given to each individual believer for the mutual edification, the building up, 
and the growth of the body of Christ and the local church. Now, if you remember back in John 14, if any of you can remember back to when we were studying through John, in John 14 and 17, Jesus told the apostles, the Holy Spirit shall be with you, but he's also going to be in you. And so we understand that part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, besides drawing us to Christ, regeneration or giving us life, sealing us, as he talks about there in Ephesians 1 that we talked about. But part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is gifting every believer in the body with some spiritual gifts that helps them and calls them to function for the building up and edification of others. We have received this grace for service. And not only does Paul talk about these gifts of grace and spiritual gifts uh, here in Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll get into those more in depth later, but as Brother Warren read in Romans chapter 12 there, we have a more extensive list there of the gifts that God has given to the church through the Holy Spirit, a gift of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about those primarily this morning because I think that there is a great misconception within the 21st century church that I go to a church to be served and not to serve. But the teaching of Scripture, I believe, teaches us that every one of us placed within the body of Christ have a gifting that God has given to us that where we will benefit other believers, but most of all glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in the outworking of that. And so we're going to talk a lot about Romans 12 that was read this morning. And you might want to turn to that because we're going to make, I'm going to make a lot of references to that. We're also going to talk some also about 1 Corinthians 12. But primarily we'll be looking at that list there. But he gives these spiritual gifts to every believer. Now, we've already established that the purpose of the church is first and foremost the glory of God. If you go back to chapter 3 and verse 21 in Ephesians, what does he say there? To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. That's the primary function of the church. The primary function of the church is to manifest, to worship in a way and serve in a way that glorifies God. That's the primary purpose uh, in that. It's not for my own personal service or satisfaction but it is for his glory. And if you go to Romans eleven thirty six 36, and Romans 16 and 27, I'm not going to turn to those, but again, the, the apostle Paul speaks there about glory to, to Christ, glory to God forever and ever. This is the function of our lives individually, and this is the function and the calling of the church. But again, the church exists secondarily to aid us in our spiritual growth, in our spiritual development, in our spiritual knowledge, and in our practical sanctification. Now, one of the things I think that is missing in many ministries is that this emphasis upon growth and increase of fruit and practical sanctification. When I speak of practical sanctification, what I'm speaking of is your practical walk with the Lord, what does that look like? Does your life look more holy since you have professed Christ? since you have named him as Lord and Savior. And so this is really the existence of the church is to aid and to help in that. And so the local church exists to equip you and I for going out into the world as witnesses for Christ, to encourage one another, and to use the spiritual gifts God has given you. And some probably are sitting here thinking, well, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Well, we're going to go through that list of spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about the spiritual gifts there of Romans chapter 12. But everyone's got one. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've got one. You may not know specifically what it is. But there's also within the context there of Romans chapter 12, the common things that God calls all believers to do. There are things maybe not necessarily that you're particular gifting, but there are to be characteristics <clears throat> that all of us as believers, there are things to where we're to strive for as believers to do and to be 
as his followers, as his disciples. Now, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Now, let me stop there for just a moment. We are, as we read here in Ephesians 4, as far as part of the function of the church is to teach the people so that they're not tossed to and fro and yanked all around by every wind of doctrine. What he says here kind of goes along with that. Let us hold fast this confession of our hope. We're not to be wavering all over the place, tossed to and fro like Paul says there in the writer of Hebrews. There's not to be a constant wavering, but we are to hold fast that confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Now let me say this. When there is unfaithfulness when there is wavering and tossing about and backsliding and lukewarmness and spiritual coldness in the life of a believer, guess whose fault it is? It's ours because he who called us is faithful. He is always faithful. We may be faithless. We may stray away from him and from obedience to his word, but God remains faithful. And so this is what he says, let us hold us fast without wavering. He who promises faithful and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So part of being in the church and having these spiritual gifts is so that we might stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In other words, my presence, my consistent presence in the exercise of my spiritual gifts And fulfilling my duty to Christ is to stimulate you to love Jesus more. And yours is to stimulate me to love Jesus more. And to increase in, as he says here, our good deeds, or we might say our spiritual fruit. We are to grow in our fruitfulness. As we've talked about before, John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And in this is my Father glorified if you bear much fruit. We are to bear more spiritual fruit in our lives as we grow as believers. Now, these young people that are in here, uh, and everybody's younger than me, just about in here, uh, but that are fairly new in their faith, we don't expect them to bear the same kind of spiritual fruit as somebody that's been around perhaps as long as Josh. In that, I don't want to point it myself, so I'll use somebody else. Or Brother Stephen back there. But we do expect a progression. And so part of being a part of the body and in the church is so that I might stimulate you or that someone else in the church, the different members of the body, would stimulate you to grow in spiritual fruitfulness for Christ and give that evidence of that. And then, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. I'm going to stop there for just a minute. Post-COVID, we had a lot of that. People saying, I'm just going to sit at home. I'm just going to do TV. I'm going to do church on my computer on TV. Not a good plan. Because by that, you're not going to be able to use your spiritual gifts to encourage others to increased love and fruitfulness and neither is somebody else going to be able to encourage you in that respect. So this is what we are to do. But we are to encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near or approaching. In other words, the closer that we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are to encourage one another more. You say, well, There's a lot of people talking about when that's going to be. Nobody knows when that's going to be, but I can tell you, today is one day closer than it was yesterday. And so we are to encourage one another in that. Now let me just say this about Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. That's a non-negotiable, okay? Being involved in a local body and committed to that is a non-negotiable for a Christian. If you're going to live the Christian life, if you're going to grow in love for Christ, if you're going to grow in fruitfulness, and if you're going to serve the Lord, it's going to have to be in a local church. I'm not saying it has to be here because there are other uh, bodies of Christ (coughs) 
that preach the word faithfully, but it's, there's no such thing as the, the idea somehow, we, we've gotten somehow this idea that somehow you can live the Christian life without being part of a church. You want me to tell you what I think of that? It's ludicrous. It's preposterous. It's unbiblical. There was a guy I remember years back. This has probably been close to 20 years ago. Um, he's gone on now. I hope he's with the Lord. But his name was Harold Camping. And he got on the radio and started telling everybody on the listening to his radio program, he said, y'all just need to leave your churches and come home and listen to me on the radio. Horrible. That's a horrible thing. It's a direct violation of the revealed will and word of God and the, and the church. And so this is what, what we're going to talk about this morning. We're, we're going to say this. That the, and to say that I don't need the church to grow as a Christian, to live the Christian life, it's, it's prideful to say that somehow I can do this without others. That I can somehow live the Christian life without knowing this person is praying for me. Without having someone to come alongside me and put their arms around me and say, I'm praying for you, or I know you're hurting, or what can I do for you? Think about what that's like. Think about what that would be like to live a life like that in isolation away from other Christians. It goes against all really how God created this world to be a societal world. I mean, you think back to the creation of the world and, and God created all these things and he said it was very good and then he created man and he said, well, there's something off here. That's my paraphrase. It's not good for him to be alone. And so he created a help meet for him because we do better societally and when we have someone alongside us. And then the same was with within Christianity, within the church, is that we do much better. We grow more in our love for Christ. We, stu- we are not isolated and we are encouraged by other believers. This is why we have this. And so this is why God has also given us spiritual gifts. You, this is where we exercise or use our spiritual gifts as a Christian. And this is how we do it. We do it in a biblical, local, New Testament body of believers. And this is where you grow. This is where you mature. And you can't do that without a serious commitment to local churches. Now, people want to talk about the universal body of Christ. I believe that there's a universal body called the church of all believers. But it's mostly represented in those that are attending and are in a local, visible New Testament body. That's where that is. You know, I I say this, that a lot of people today seem to want to have the church, but without a serious commitment. They want to have this like what I would call a light affiliation, or I would even say a flirtatious relationship with the church instead of being in a covenantal relationship with the church. It's sort of like, you know, I've, I've seen examples through the years where uh, a man and a woman are courting back and forth. I'll use the word courtship. I guess dating is a more contemporary word. Not that that. And I've heard about people say, yeah, we dated for, for five or ten years. I'm sort of like, Really? Let me tell you something. When I met my wife, I almost instantly knew this is the one. I didn't want a part-time casual relationship. I wanted to be in covenant relationship with her, and so I married her. (laughs) And very glad that I did. The same way with the church. You ought not to be satisfied with a casual relationship with the church. As you men fall in love with your wives and want to marry them and commit to them, those that love Christ ought to want to join or at least be committed very firmly with the church body. 
I mean, that's, I believe, the Scriptures. This is what the Scriptures teach in this. Now, somebody's probably sitting there thinking, man, you, you sound like you, you, you know, this church expects more, this pastor expects more out of church membership or commitment than most churches I know of. Yes. <laughs> I believe that. I believe it. That we are to have not just, and I tell everyone that comes into this and wants to join with the body and these kind of things, I say, well, here, one thing, we do not believe in non-participatory church membership. Number one, it's for your good. And number two, it's for also the glory of God, excuse me, glory of God first, your good, and for the exercise of whatever spiritual gift that God has given you. If you're not committed to a church body, you are not exercising your spiritual gift for the benefit of others, and you are not being benefited. I believe that's what the Word of God teaches. And so, you know, and I hear sometimes, I've heard this through the years, I have nothing to contribute to the church. I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. I don't have any of these things to contribute. Let me tell you something. All of us, as we see from Romans chapter 12 especially, all of us have common things we can contribute. Every one of us has access to the throne of God. Every single one of us can pray for one another, individually and corporately. We can also come alongside each other to exhort, to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ who are in pain or suffering. We can come together to encourage them through our public worship before others and our families also. You know, and this is one of the things, and I've had heard these discussions about integrated family worship. Anybody that comes here notices, wow, you, all the kids are in here. What's the benefit of that? I'll tell you the benefit of it. They see mommy and daddy worshiping God together. They see mommy and daddy praying together in the church. They hear mommy and daddy singing hymns of praise to our God, and they see mommy and daddy sitting under the preaching of the word and listening attentively. And you can't know what effect that has upon these little children. They absorb more than you can ever imagine in that. But this is what we can do that are the public things, and it is usually in those common areas of service that our spiritual calling is discovered and displayed. Now I'm going to go back here for just a little while to the book of Romans. Book of Romans here, chapter 12. You know, uh, I'm looking here. Somebody stole my clock. So I guess that means I can just preach as long as I want to. <laughs> I don't know where it went. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> oh, I've got a watch on. Sorry. <laughs> but in chapter 12 there, let's look at this list here of Romans 12 about this using these gifts that God has given us within the church. First of all, where does it start? Verse 1 is where it starts. Not verse 3, but verse 1. So I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So it begins with giving ourselves, our bodies, sacrificially to God as an act of worship. Okay? This is where it begins. To borrow a phrase that I detest, that I hear in the abortion issue, people saying, my body, my choice. No, it's not. It's not true in that realm, and it's especially not true in this realm either. Because once you've been saved by the grace of God, He is your Lord first and Savior. You are His bond slave, his servant, as the Apostle Paul said. You are a prisoner of the Lord, as he says in that. If you look back just a few chapters there at Romans 6, and there in verses 12 through 13, the Apostle Paul said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God 
as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Your body, your physical body, is to be used for the glory of God. It is not to be used for your own personal glory, but for His glory. If you go over <clears throat> to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and there in verse 20, or verses 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Your body that you have. Now, I don't, you know, I mean, I admire people that have the discipline to, like, work out and to run and to keep their bodies fit. I will confess I don't have that discipline. Don't have it. I would wish I did. But the idea here that Paul says as we discipline ourselves spiritually and use this body to glorify God. And I believe this applies, particularly we were talking this morning in the prayer time about missionaries and the sacrifices that they make. They are seeing their lives and their bodies not for their own use to stay in the comforts of home, but to go to a foreign land and to suffer there for the cause of Christ. They are using their bodies there for Christ and submitting their bodies as an act of worship. Secondly, he says here, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So our minds are transformed by renewing through the Spirit and the Word so we can know what is good and pleasing to Him. So there is in the work of our spiritual service, uh, the giving up of ourselves sacrificially, we submit our minds to Christ to think upon Christ, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, think on these things. Because we don't want to go back. Do you really want to go back to where you were? What were you before, before salvation? What was your mind like? Well, look at chapter 2, verse 3. The Apostle Paul said there, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. So we are to submit ourselves there. Uh, in our minds for the cause of Christ. In verse 17 here in chapter 4 of Ephesians, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So our minds even, this, this spiritual service and this use of our gifts, whatever that is that God has given to us, we use our mind in that regard. This is what we are to do in this respect. And so again, there's many other passages of Scripture I could go to. So we're to be, our minds are to be renewed. Number three, what is another area of, of, well, really this gets to the first area of gifting. After we give ourselves as a living sacrifice, after we are putting ourselves and our minds are being transformed by the Word of God and the Spirit, he said, then for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than I ought to think, and he's going down through here, then he goes down here, then he talks about prophecy, the gift of prophecy. Now, most people think when he talks about the gift of prophecy there, that it's about foretelling, telling the future, whatever like that. And it does have that connotation. But it also has to do there, in verse 6 there, it has to do with the proclamation of the revealed will of God. And the revealed word of God. So it has to do with that proclamation of the gospel. Of the truth of God's word. And this is so God gives in the church those that have the gifting of the proclamation of this. Because this is what, this is what he had said that, that he, he would do. This is how men are saved. This is how the church is edified in these things. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So how do men hear the gospel of Christ? 
God gifts within the church, men like Paul and Peter and the apostles and others down the way, and we know of others in the scripture that are spoken of, of Apollos, with a proclamation, speaking the prophetic word, speaking the revealed will of God. Not everybody has that. In fact, you know, I mean, the Lord called me to that. That was his gifting to me. He gave me a big mouth and showed me how to use it for him. Okay? In all of those things. But... For most people, standing in front of a group like this is terrifying. It's terrifying. But the gifting is in different areas. But it was necessary for the proclamation of the word of God. God chose for the preaching of this book to be the instrument through which men are born again. So he has gifted men to preach the word. By the way, I don't believe in women preachers if you get that. It's men. Well, we'll stop there and I won't elaborate on that, but I believe that's the leadership, that's the ordained method by God, of God. But then he talks about, we go on in these gifts of service that are given through Christ. Also, we see here that he talks about the gift of serving. He talks about there in verse 7. If service in our serving. Now, my wife and I were having a discussion about that this morning on the way to church, about the gift of service. Now, any of you have known her for very long? Her name is Mary, but she's got a Martha heart. God has given her that gift. It is a gift to serve, and we have other people within this church, men and women, that have that gifting. To serve the Lord. God gives them that burden to serve the Lord. And in case you hadn't noticed, you look outside and the lawns are neatly mowed and the grass is all manicured and the kitchen is clean and coffee was made this morning and all of those kind of things. Somebody served. God gives to the sir, to the church gifts of service. We see it in the person of Christ. As we were told, let this mind be in you, which was also Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made he was made into man, the image of a man. He was made man, but he became a servant. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve, to give my life a ransom for many. But this is to be what many people are called to as a gift of service within the church. If you've got that gift, use it. If that's what you want to do, use it. I can put you in contact with some people in here that will be glad to put you in that spot. I'm one of them. But he gives us those giftings. Then he talks about in verse 8, the gift of teaching. Look there, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, excuse me, uh, the one, yeah, the one, latter part of verse 7, sorry there, the one who teaches in his teaching. God gives that gift of teaching. Or the word really there has to do with doctrine. It has to do with the teaching of doctrine. Many times when you see in the King James where it talks about teaching, it's the word doctrine that is used there. I'm glad that God has gifted us in this body with various ones to teach the word of God. Giving them that desire that they want to teach the word, to speak the word. Not all of those that have the gift of teaching are going to be elders or pastors, but they have that gifting. They have that desire to teach God's Word, and He gives them that gifting within the body of Christ. He gives that to them. Then in in verse 8, He says, The one who exhorts in his exhortation. Okay? We need those that will exhort within the body of Christ. We need that. And that exhort has to do also with encouragement. And I believe the word there also talks about that word. You've heard us use the word in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, parakaleo or paraclete, the one that comes comes alongside and aids and supports. That's what he's talking about here. Someone who has that gifting to come alongside and encourage and exhort fellow believers. We need that. Every single one of us needs that encouragement. Don't tell me that you haven't at various times in your life within the church as a Christian needed the encouragement of a brother or sister in Christ. And if you're outside the church, you don't have somebody to do that for you. And so we have those. There are those that are given to the church. Maybe you're one of those. Then he says here, 
the one who contributes or the one who gives in generosity. Now, let me say this. I believe that every believer within the church ought to be giving. I won't get many amens on that, but anyway. (laughs) I believe it's a given. If you love Christ and you're part of the church, you give. You give to the church. You support the church. But what he's talking about here are those, I think, that have a bigger heart, so to speak. I don't think it has to do really with whether you have a bigger bank account. Although I I love people that have big bank accounts and they give to the church. I don't have one of those, but anyway. But the idea here is having a generous heart to give, to contribute to the needs of the ministry of the Word of God and to the ministry of the church so that the Word of God can continue to grow and so that we can support more missionaries. Right now we support about five. It would be great to be able to do that about ten. Something like that, but to be more, be able to be more effective and to spread the word of God. Now, I don't love modern technology uh, like some of you do. Like you know, I mean, uh, I hear you people talking about all this technology and this and that platform and all that. Like, I think you might as well be speaking Chinese. But. God has given some means by which we can send the gospel and the word of God out more effectively from this place in places where maybe somebody can't hear it. And so giving to the church enables us to do that for his glory in that. And then he talks about here also the one who leads with zeal. The one who leads with zeal. It's the gift of leadership. Now, and we see that. Paul talks about that in the Scripture in a couple other places. I'll just read uh, really one of these. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12 where he talks about this. And he says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you or over you in the Lord and admonish you or, or, or in leadership that are, you know, leading in the flock, leading the church kind of a thing. He gives that spirit of boldness. And leadership, two people, not everybody has that. But God gives that to some people. And he says to do it with diligence. And then he talks about down there the gift of mercy. It really, what that's talking about there is about being compassionate. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a very compassionate or merciful heart as a believer in Christ? Perhaps some of the circumstances of your life have caused you to be more compassionate in your life. Then exercise that, that, I believe, that gift or that calling to exercise mercy with the people of God in that. And he says to do it with cheerfulness. And then I really don't have time to go through all of these uh, you guys really shouldn't have stolen my clock, whoever got it. I'm already over. I'm going to finish this. In verses 9 through 21, he talks about common things here. Here are the common things that we're to do. As he has now given us the Holy Spirit, and we have the fruit of the Spirit, we do these common things, all of us, in verses 9 through 21. We cling to what is good and not evil. We show brotherly love for the brethren. That's another non-negotiable. If you're a Christian, you're going to show brotherly love to other believers. Humility by showing preference to one another. We all ought to be striving to be the most humble. And by that, be humble without wanting the recognition for being humble. Being diligent in our service to the Lord. We're to all be diligent in the service of the Lord. Pastors, elders, deacons shouldn't have to beg people to do things within the church. Rejoicing in the hope of the Lord is placed within us. Do you rejoice in the hope that God has given us, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, the hope of eternal life? Do you rejoice in that? Do people hear you rejoice in that and speak with gladness concerning that? persevering in the midst of our afflictions, both spiritual and physical. Those are hard. Those things are difficult. But are you persevering in that? I thought about, as I looked at this, I thought about Joseph who was sold into slavery and went through many years of hardship in his life, really 
to use the term, none of which really he really deserved or was looking for. And you can, I can imagine that all those years in imprisonment and being in, being in prison in Egypt and serving over there, he's thinking, why am I here, God? But he remained faithful. We never seem complaining about those things. And then the providence of God shows, I put you there so that you can not only deliver many millions in Egypt from starving to death, but also you can preserve Israel. Are you persevering in the midst of these things? Devoted to prayer. Every single Christian, every single Christian should be devoted to prayer. The hardest thing in the world I found in my ministry, and I remember my dad's ministry, he was in the ministry for 60 years, is to get people to pray. Devoted to prayer, all of us are to be. Contributing to the needs of the saints. There we go again with that giving thing. We need to be doing that. Pursuing hospitality. I love, let me tell you something, I love the hospitality of our church. I love it. I mean, I see there at lunchtime, you see it all over the place. Here, try my food. No, try my food. No, here, take mine. No. It's almost, they get, almost get offended if you don't partake some of their food, so I have to try all of it. But the hospitality in the homes, to open our homes. I've seen homes opened up. And so pursuing those things and blessing and loving those who persecute us, there's a lot of opportunity for that in this day and time. You know, one of the things that grieves me in this day and time is the thing with social media where you hear all these different opinions, the worldly spouting their stuff off, and then you get somebody that's quote-unquote a Christian, and they're being just as hateful back to them. Well, I'm just defending the truth. No, you're not. We need to show love, speak of the love of Christ in those things, show a loving spirit. We, we can speak the truth, but the scripture tells us to do that in love. Being like-minded, rejoicing with those that rejoice, weeping with those that weep, not prideful but humble, and overcoming the evil of men with goodness and righteousness of God. And what is the purpose of all of these gifts that have been given and living out here? In the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, the same Lord. There are varieties of workings, but the same God who works everything and everyone. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is profitable. We do these things not for our own personal recognition, but we do it to profit the, the church of God and the others within the body and to bring honor to His name. They are not given for this. They're not given for applause. They're given for the purpose of the building up of other believers within the church. And let me just say this. I'm just going to say this while I'm standing up here. I don't like applause in the church. I'll just be perfectly honest with you. Applause is if you want to go to a concert and you want to applaud somebody, go applaud them. But anything that anybody does within the church, it better be for the glory of God and to honor Him. You want to give a hearty amen or praise the Lord? Do that. But the gifts are given to benefit one another. And everything that you do a part of this body in the exercise of your gifts, the service of one to another is for the glory of God and the benefit of those people that you're sitting in front of you, beside you, and all around you. It's for my benefit to help me, to encourage me. It's for, I'm not going to name names, for all of you, all of those people look around there. What you are doing in the church and serving the Lord with your gifts is for their benefit and vice versa. That's what it's for. This is these gifts that Paul is talking about and they are sovereignly given by God. Let me say, to use a phrase, this is where the rubber meets the road. Are you using your gifts for the glory of God and to benefit people in the body of Christ? You've been given spiritual gifts. Use them. And it is according to his gift, according to the measure of God's gift. And the word for measure here is metron, which by implication means a limited portion or measure. Let me say this. None of us gets all of the gifts. 
Paul didn't get all the gifts. Peter didn't get all the gifts. Charles Spurgeon didn't get all the gifts. John Owen didn't get all the gifts. None of these guys got all of the gifts in the full measure. God gives it as he pleases. You know, sometimes some people, well, I wish I could preach like Charles Spurgeon. Be careful what you wish for. Because with that responsibility that he had, he carried a heavy burden. He carried a heavy burden. That's in God's sovereignty. He bestows it as he sees fit, to whom he sees fit to bestow it upon. We are, but what we are responsible for as believers is for what God gives us. Are we using our gift or gifts wisely and diligently? 1 Corinthians 4 and 2, Paul says it is required of stewards that one be found faithful. Are you being faithful in the use of your gifts as a child of God? That's all. You're not responsible for what somebody across the aisle or at the back of the church or the front of the church is doing. You're only going to be responsible for what gifting God has given you. Are you using those gifts for His glory? Are you being obedient in those things that He expects of every believer? I believe that we're not going to be judged for salvation as regards because we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. But when we stand before God, I do believe that believers are going to be judged for what they have done with the gifts that God has given. In Romans 14 and 12, Paul wrote, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. If he was to ask you today, if you were to stand before God today, could you say, I am using my gifts as I ought to and consistently as I ought to within the church for the glory of God and the good of my fellow believers, those people that I proclaim that I love as children of God? Are you doing that? Here, that's the question. That's the examination that we are to have. Are we doing that? Are we being faithful to Him? Are we exercising those spiritual gifts? Are we growing in love and encouraging others to grow in love? Are we encouraging others in the body to increase in fruitfulness? This is why I believe that Paul says this here, that we are given these spiritual gifts he gave us grace according to the measure of his, of his gift so that we might glorify God, build up the church, and encourage one another in growth and fruitfulness and in love for Christ. I pray that you're doing that. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given us first in salvation, but also the grace that you've given us in so many other ways. Lord, your grace sustains us. Your grace helps us to persevere. Your grace helps us through suffering. Your grace helps us to serve. Your grace helps us to give. Your grace helps us to love one another. And we thank you for that. And I pray, Father, Lord, point out to all of us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, may we examine ourselves from the first to the last of us. Am I using my gifts for the glory of God, for the service, for service to my fellow believers in Christ? Heavenly Father, impress upon us. Bring, Father, a reviving in your church, your visible church today of this, that we are here to serve you first, to love you first, and then to serve and to love those around us, secondly. Father, help us to do that through, the, through, through your Holy Spirit. Give us increased diligence in all of these things. And we pray all these things in your holy name. Amen.